Good evening and welcome to the fourth and final talk in the Making the Past Our Present series presented by the Irish Baroque Orchestra in partnership with the National Concert Hall Dublin. As with all the talks in this series there will be a question and answer session at the end so please feel free to submit your questions via the comment or chat functions and we'll try and get through as many as we can in the time available. Our speaker today is cellist Aoife Nikapik. As a member of the Irish Baroque Orchestra and Irish Chamber Orchestra, Aoife will be a familiar face to many of you watching today. Aoife currently teaches cello at the Royal Irish Academy of Music, Court School of Music and University of Limerick and specialises in Baroque cello and chamber music. She also performs regularly for John Elliott Gardner's Orchestra Revolutionnaire et Romantique and has toured extensively worldwide. She appears with the IBO on June the 10th as part of the NCH's Spring Summer Variations series and we'll be hearing a little more about that programme shortly. Aoife, it's great to have you with us today. Thank you so much. Over to you. In, in for practice at home I mostly practice in a very small uh, bedroom if you imagine hello and welcome to my practice room um, I'm Aoife Nicocli from the Irish Baroque Orchestra as you know and well this isn't actually my practice room I lie I'm in my uh, mom's house which is down by the sea and it's not too far from where I live and there's a lovely music room and I um, I would, it is partly a practice room I use because I would come here if I have time, if I have a decent chunk of time to practice, I'll drive down, it's only about half an hour. And I find it's great to practice in a nice space with nice views. Um, just if, to see a tree, to see the, I can see the nice river here and um, there's good light and space and the sound is good and that makes a big difference I find. Um, in, for practice at home, I mostly practice in a very small uh, bedroom. If you imagine your normal uh, semi-detached home in Ireland and the little box room upstairs, you can imagine. Um, there's not much room to play a cello in there, but it's absolutely fine. But when possible, I would definitely choose to be in a, a bigger space. And also not disturbing any neighbours, because that's part of practice. You know, they all say, oh, it's lovely to live near musicians. We love music. But the reality is it often drives people a bit mad because there's a lot of repetition. And it's not like we sit there playing lovely melodies all day long. Uh, practice can sound quite odd some of the time. Um, so I'm going to be talking a little bit about the Bach Cantata program that's coming up with IBO. Very much looking forward to that. Um, it, especially these days in COVID times, the thought of actually sitting down and playing great music with lovely people is so exciting. It kind of reminds me of being, uh, being a teenager or even younger, and going to music camp or something. It's just, it's so nice to play with other people and the lockdowns were difficult for that. Um, I really missed playing with other people. But saying that, um, I did really reconnect to practicing again uh, in a different way. Of course, I've always been practicing before COVID, but uh, practice was something that had to be done because there was this repertoire, that repertoire, this project, that project. Um, and it just kind of rolled on like that. There wasn't much time to practice things that I really wanted to practice or play. Um, so in the lockdown, 
I, I took out bits of music and thought I'd really like to practice this today and really enjoyed not having this pressure that I was going to have to perform it. I was like, I'm just going to work on something. I'm going to try and develop part of my playing um, and really think about uh, something in my playing a little bit deeper and connect to that. Um, and that was great, actually. I must say, I'm trying to keep that up now that things are starting up a little bit again. Um, I'm trying to kind of get back into that uh, mindset of, of having a very deep uh, connection to practice, a very deep awareness of, I would say, of what I'm doing. That's really what uh, practice has become for me. It's like being in a state of hyper awareness exactly what are you doing how are you doing it is that what you want to be doing are you going to change it or you know asking those questions seeing what happens um so right now i'm looking at the aria from the cantata uh, 51 which has trumpet and soprano um it has a wonderful opening you know with trumpet and strings and then arrested and then comes this aria for cello uh, I say cello you see because I'm thinking oh I have to do something of course it's continual aria I'm not going to be all on my own um, but that's sometimes the feeling especially everyone's playing and then when everyone stops playing and you're sitting there and you look across at your lovely friends with their violins and violas and trumpet and they put their instruments down and then you have to keep going uh, I sometimes find that a bit nerve-wracking, to be honest. Um, but it's okay, because I know that I might feel a bit self-conscious, or I might feel a bit nervous. I might feel really excited, in a way, because I, I love this aria. It's so beautiful. Um, and I'm so happy that I'm going to play it. And I love accompanying singers. Um, so, yeah, nervous, but nervous in a way that's excited, you know? Like getting on a roller coaster and thinking, I love roller coasters, they're great fun, but still, your tummy kind of starts to feel a bit butterflies, doesn't it? Um, so, uh, the opening uh, is an open A string. So, on the cello, this string is the kind of most, uh, it's the thinnest and the most kind of tightly, kind of, uh, you know, it's the, it's the highest string. So, if you imagine it's kind of stretched a bit more tight. And without much care and thought, it can rasp, make that raspy sound, which I don't like. Um, and for my, me, myself, I find if, if I make a sound that under my ear makes a whistle or a raspy sound, it, it kind of it makes me feel a bit like, ooh, I can't stand it. So then it will set me off not feeling good for the rest of the phrase. So I have to practice two things here. I need to practice finding a way of making a sound that's going to make me happy. And how I'm going to do that. There's a, I, I really have to think about this one because uh, the, the weight of my bow and the kind of speed I go at is going to make a big difference to the sound. If I go too fast, it's going to do that. And if I go too slow, it's going to do that. So it's a real balancing act. And the thing is, I know how to do it, you know, I, I know how to play the cello. Um, but we just never know how we're going to feel at a certain time and what could happen. So I, my point is, I try to practice the things I know already and see if I can know them in a better way. Can I really know what I'm doing? So that if my tummy, if I've got butterflies and if someone in the audience, has some, imagine we had an audience, that would be nice. But something's happening somewhere, I'm distracted, okay? And then can I still know how to do that? That's what I need to practice. So I try to feel it everywhere, I feel in my feet. What do they feel like? Are they really grounded? And what's happening with my um, core, my, my tummy? We, we can't see behind the cello. What's happening there? Am I tightening it? Is it loose? Is it okay? Am I breathing? And then... So if you know this, uh, you'll probably think, oh, she's a bit 
bit slow. And yes, I am playing it a bit slow. I've spent most of my life practicing too fast. So I'm on a mission. I'm like, I've got to practice slower, but slow everything down. Um, it makes it makes it better. It makes me feel better, and um, it it has better results. So I'm purposefully doing it a bit slower. I'm also kind of looking around, and that's because again, um, if I'm tense um, or if I'm uh, sometimes in a rehearsal or concert, it might be in a state of over focus. It might relate to that feeling when you're kind of overly concentrated on something. It has that frown then I might stare at each note and then I could get a little bit stuck in each um, in each note on the page and it can almost become blurry and that's not a nice feeling. So I practice um, moving away from the page and back to the page and looking around just to keep the kind of uh, periphery there and, uh, and taking in a more global um, vision. And uh, that's that. That's just keeps. Anyway, I, I find it something that that definitely helps um, my playing if I if I think like that. So, yeah, that was that bit. I'm going to um, I, rather than playing you the whole cello part, um, I'm going to show you something else that I like to do in my practice. This practice isn't in order, by the way. I forgot to do some warming up. I'm going to jump back and already warmed up today but we'll do a bit of that as well. I like to do a bit of karaoke so this is my style of karaoke. I put on a nice recording. I've got to get a bit, I've got to be ready to go here. So I find a recording and I play along with it and this isn't something I used to do much of at all because a lot of the time teachers would say oh you should just do your own have your own interpretation and find your own way. Uh, which of course is something I've practiced and I do, but I, I sometimes, even though I can hear the other parts in my head when I play, um, it's sometimes not enough. And I find it great just to be, to immerse oneself into the, into the music and really listen and, and feel the, the words, feel the text, feel the singing, feel the atmosphere. And it pushes me to, um, to maybe have to swing the tempo a little bit in a way that I hadn't thought about it. And it's not necessarily going to be like this when I play it um, in the project, but I'm building up a kind of flexibility to be ready um, for that. So I might play to some different recordings and, and see if I can, I can be super flexible and fit with what I'm hearing. So I'm gonna do a little bit of that. Here's the work. for something else a few weeks ago which was driving me a bit mad because it had some uh, tricky rhythms in it and I, I found a recording and I did the same and I put two of these in and I turned it up quite loud so I couldn't hear myself and I played through the movement three times and I swear it, it was a problem solver you know um, for many reasons, I kept going and I was feeling, listening to everyone else, took me out of my own part. And yeah, I fluffed a few things, it wasn't perfect, but I wasn't stopping to kind of fix them the whole time. Um, and even though people will say, you know, practice is for kind of tidying up and making everything perfect, we also have to practice allowing things not to be perfect, if that makes sense. I don't know if it does. You kind of have to go along and let something be what it was and be okay with it. Because that's what live performance is about. It's about 
letting it go by and going on to the next bit. If you keep practicing in a way that you stop to fix all these tiny things, then you're practicing stopping. Um, and then when you go into rehearsal or a concert, you're used to stopping all the time. So I find that one really, oh yeah, I find that really fascinating because it's also necessary to fix those things. So how would we do that? I would say just to separate the type of practice. So sometimes I'll practice something in a way that is really to stop and, and sort things out a lot. I'll jump to a, a different bit of music. And we'll, oh, there it is. Um, I'm looking at the final aria in the cantata 82. Um, this is quite fast and it's quite noty. And actually right now it's suddenly gone a bit dark. So there we go. I've got different challenges here. There's, there's quite a lot of notes. And it's hard to see. So what will I think of? What you know, how can I take that on and think, okay, what would be a sensible way to practice this now? Um, it's not time for me to play it up to tempo. Um, it will be quite fast. It's it's a it's like a dance, this this final movement. And you know, when you think if if you know what the cantata is about, um, it's about dying and, and, and the jo like the joy of like I'm I'm gonna die and I'm gonna be in a great place. So th at this moment, it's like I'm gonna die and let's have a big party and there's some dance music to kind of celebrate the plummet into death. So the end of the previous recit, uh, the continuum will bring us down to the grave. <laughs> Better. 
Tommy. I might write the word Tommy and that'll just remind me to let it go. Think of a balloon at full. And if I let it go, yeah. And if you see that, that it actually has a real effect on where the cello is, you know, because it can push this way or that way. And if my hands are moving around here at speed and this is going up and down, well then it's not really good news. Um, so that's... So I'll, I'll spend a little bit of time finding, uh, finding the feeling, if you like, finding the what is the lilt, what is the dance, what's the, what are the words, what am I imagining in, in this moment. Um, and being aware that I'm joining in, so the music already begins. I'm joining on to something, like getting on an escalator. Yeah, so that's feeling a bit better, but I still would say that this movement is going to make me feel like that. A little bit like that. Not kind of nervous, like scared, but it's, 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 it's fast and it's exciting. Um, so I need to go further in my practice to feel more grounded. So in that case, I might go slower again, and and not even just slower, but actually see if I can if I can put more weight into things. So that's going to be my bow here. I'm going to feel more. right now and just feel like this is this is good for my big muscles to feel it this way yeah and to practice that uh, into their into their memory if you like yeah <laughs> They, they rarely sound like a note, they often sound like a ship coming in to a dock or some furniture being moved across the floor. So that's a note that I will spend a bit of time finding the right weight and speed of the bow. That's going to make it sound like a really good note. Um, the other thing is that in the rehearsals, uh, what happens is like, oh, can we go to, can we go to the second bar? So in which case that would mean, and it might be like, oh, actually no, we'll, we'll really go to the third bar. So that would be a different shape. Um, or might go wild and even go further, try and try and even make a bigger phrase. Yeah. So all of those options, any of those could happen. Okay. Um, and I myself might have a, a, a feeling that I'm doing it one way or another, uh, which might be the same as whoever's directing, or it might be different. And I have to be ready and able to to change at a moment's notice. So that's something else that I would always incorporate into the practice. Um, thinking, okay, go to bar one. Now try go to bar two. Now try to go to that. What and what happens when I do that? So the further I try to go, I feel again that my uh, the direction, the musical direction, has an influence on what happens. In my body. If I try now again, I'm going to go to the fourth bar and let's see what actually happens to me physically. See? So there I am. If I pause exactly where I am, I can describe to you that I'm. My, my uh, legs are beginning to kind of quiver a little bit because I'm holding them quite tight now. 
Okay, my cello, actually you can only see maybe I'm five or something in the room. This is not the position my head began at. My head began here. Okay, so I've done an almighty kind of uh, push forward. My enthusiasm to go further in the phrase, yeah. Um, it's not a massive problem, is it? I mean, it, it maybe it'll be okay. But long term, um, I'll end up with sore legs and a sore back. And I don't think I'm getting the best sound by doing it that way. So this is where kind of habits come in. And these are the hardest things to, to change. So again, I, I really now, I'm gonna try and think. And I, when I try and think of doing something else, it might mean that I'll mess something else up. But you know what, I'm willing, I'm willing to let that happen. That's okay. Let's see. <laughs> trying to really think of a habit and then I'm thinking so much about that I'm not really sure of what uh, what I think about what I just played was it steady was it a tune you can tell me um, but anyway if this was really my practice and I wasn't talking um, and explaining what I'm doing I would I would go really really deep into all of these different elements of things that I've just been talking about and I would spend a lot of time trying to find the sound that I want. It's one thing I think dominates my practice, maybe sometimes, well, not too much, not too much. Uh, but I spend a lot of time really, really thinking about the sound that I want somewhere. I'm thinking of the little cascade into the grave in the previous recit. And I play it slowly. <laughs> conscious space perhaps and I often zone out a little bit and not zone out of what I'm doing in fact I'm going really deep into what I'm trying to find and then I lose sense of what else is happening so sometimes if family members come into the room I'm practicing in and I'm in that state of mind I absolutely jump off the chair and they're like it's just me you know I'm just at home calm down um, but yeah, sometimes I get into a kind of trance state, um, listening to things. And especially on some notes in the cello, because you can really find, um, they, I'm, I don't think it's going to come across in the microphone. But if you play, play a note and really find the 
core of the sound, then you hear other other notes, like all the overtones that belong to that. And uh, once you can kind of hear those, um, you can kind of feel them as well in the bow. <laughs> searching for it and um, yeah sometimes too much sometimes I find that's a little bit of a habit in my practice I'll spend so long maybe just playing a note luxuriating in what kind of sounds I can find in there and uh, that's one of the joys of practicing and more so on the on gut strings, on the baroque cello, like they're different to the modern strings. They're a lot looser, there's a looser tension, and they're really thick. And uh, I find they, they have much more uh, variable sound than, than a steel string. Um, so yeah, I always enjoy that about the, the gut strings. So yeah, a little, um, little bit of story time about practicing and what I've just been describing now about you know finding things and zoning out and that side of practice um, that's not what all practices a lot of the time it's simply a matter of really just having to sit down and learn learn a lot of notes um, but I do really enjoy that as I said just really listening and being with the instrument and finding finding sounds and in the, one of the recent lockdowns, how many have we had? Anyway, sometime in the last few months, I did a boga course with the wonderful Rachel Todger online. Boga being yoga for the bow. And it's a great name, isn't it? And uh, it was brilliant. I, you know, it was such a good class. And spending up to an hour just doing exercises, really, in, in feeling... Uh, Kind of, well, I'll, I'll explain a few of them. I mean, some of them are just about really feeling the weight of the bow. So you'd start by, you know, with your bow hold. If you if you play an instrument, you'll, you'll know what this is about. Uh, otherwise, you can just think of, maybe just imagine having something. If you play tennis or you play golf or uh, even uh, cooking and having a utensil, just the, the weight of having something in your hand. And then... Imagine if you changed it to something different, of a different weight, and what has to happen then? What, what adjusts? See, we don't even think about it. It's like when we go to pick something up and it looks heavy, so you go, and then it actually turns out it's light, and your arm flicks up like that. Um, that's, it's all this habitual behavior. Um, so these exercises are to really feel the bow and to kind of connect to the weight of it. Um, so in my warm-up, which I skipped because I went straight into solo music because I wanted to play along with Lutfi, um, I would do some of these exercises of feeling that weight going over at various angles. And when it's over here, it's very strange because obviously I don't play the instrument like that. It feels really heavy on my first finger. And then this one feels easy, comfortable. And then back to kind of playing position again, which I suppose is more here than playing the cello. And I'll hold it there and try and, and feel what, what's, what does that feel like throughout my, the rest of my arm into my back. And, and focus on, on really being aware of that. I find this is one of the best exercises I got from the class because... I can then use the same exercise on my modern bow, which I've used with modern cello, which is much heavier. And then I can really feel the difference in weight in the hands. Um, and then already if I go to play something, <laughs> tendency just to to go put the bow on the string 
I go push. And if I've really connected to the weight, I feel I can bow a little bit more uh, into the string and a bit slower. Which for you, the audience, if you're listening, um, you'll hear more detail. Rather than a wash, try and think you'll hear more vibrant color rather than a pastel shade sweeping by. Okay? Um, I need to be able to do both of those because there's moments where you want something just to. Or in, in the other movement, which I don't have in front of me. So while I'm talking about this, it's making me look at some of the notes and think there's so much more that I can think of now already. There's so much more to delve into, even this passage where I was trying not to go up into the sky, but to lean back, also thinking of... Um, what, what depth of colour do I want for that? And to find that, what I might try to do then as well is to ease um, ease into the sound in a different way. So slurs, in case you don't know what slurs are, it's when there's two or more notes in, in the same bow. See, I put in two notes, but I just did uh, one bow. And if I don't slur, I would do so that I'm moving this at the same time. Um, and that's separate, we call that separate. So I would sometimes practice everything separate so that I can find exactly the, the steps, if you like, and really concentrate on each note. practice you know this is the this is what we'll, 
I'll remember and it, it's a big part of my life still but especially when I was younger and it, can, it just it's such, it's such a big part of our lives um, when will I practice and what will I practice all of those kind of things and if I really think back on my time practicing over the many years I've been practicing um, it's only recently that I will really think of what am I going to practice and uh, what am I going to find out in that rather than I need to go and do this thing you know um, it's a mindset actually so if you are someone who plays an instrument um, I, I must say I find it really useful to think of it in a in a more curious way like what am I going to find out in my practice today and how can I develop it all those kind of things. Um, I would say the best practice I ever did was when I was preparing for an audition. My eldest son was about seven or eight months old and my husband was really busy at the time. So I was um, having to manage my time and I would practice when, uh, when the baby slept for his nap. He usually had a nap for up to two hours from 12 to two. And then he'd go down to bed at about seven in the evening. Um, so that was my my time. I said from 12 to 2 I'll get at least an hour and a half if I'm lucky even a bit more of practice done and maybe a bit more in the evening. So I was so diligent about this. I, I had this audition coming up and I, I knew I just needed the time and I had panicked before that I'll never have time to practice. I have a new baby and it'll be impossible. Um, but yeah I used that time and I would map out exactly what things I would do in the time, how I would do them. And one thing I haven't mentioned in what I'm practicing now is that um, there's a point at which you might play something. I'll take this little phrase. <laughs> thing that I, I learned in this, this uh, practice years ago when I didn't have much time when the baby was asleep. It's like to practice something and if it was good to, to really say it to myself and say you've got that bit and then move on to the next bit. Otherwise nothing ever feels done and I was, I've always been a bit envious of um, artists. My brother is a, a wonderful artist and he, when he has uh, paintings, when he's got an exhibition and we go and see his work and they're all there and it's all done. And I, I said to him, I said, it's all done. You don't have to go up and start making little changes. And of course he'll say, well, you look at your art and you think, well, he'll have his own um, demons with that, I suppose, and think maybe I could do this or next time I'll try that or whatever. But absolutely, he can stand back and feel, look at it and feel a uh, real pride in, in that. And for us as musicians, that's a harder thing to do because it, it happens in the moment. And our perception of what's even happening in the moment is, is only our perception. It's not the same as the person who's listening in the audience or the people you're playing with. Um, so it's very different to, um, to painting or any other types of art in that way. Um, so as I said, I used to be kind of jealous of that. I thought, I wish I could just do it and then that was it. And in a way you could say recordings are like that, but I'm not convinced really, because I think that's a whole other ball game. We'll talk about that another day. Um, but the beauty of something happening live is that things can happen in the moment uh, that are very spontaneous. And if we can embrace that and go with it, then really amazing moment, moments happen or sometimes a little calamity um, but they they make for 
really good stories. So all in all, um, live performance is, is a great thing. And I miss it and look forward to playing to people again. But the, um, yeah, the idea of in practice to, uh, this is what I would say I was kind of um, inspired by uh, artists and is, is particularly looking at my brother's work. I was like, maybe I can do that in my practice. Maybe I can play something and think that's good. You've got that bit and imagine it's, it's, it's art. Imagine that I've created that and it's in there if I want it, you know, if I'm going to reproduce it again to trust that it's in there and it might be a bit different, it might feel different, but it's done. Um, and that's a real, I think that's had a, a positive influence on a lot of my practice, uh, especially for, for really challenging things. You know, if you play it and you're practicing things, I really did it. And then say, I did it, I've got it now, it's, it's in there. And uh, trust that it'll appear when you need it. And if it doesn't, then, you know, life goes on. Music is still there and uh, still there to enjoy. So I'm going to say goodbye there and uh, I, I look forward to hearing if you have any questions or thoughts and maybe some of you will talk about your own uh, practice routines and we can, uh, we can have questions and answers about that. Thank you very much. Hi Aoife, thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you so much. That was really super. And um, I mean, there's so much food for thought there. Plenty of ideas. I love the idea of curious practice and also the writing directions in the part um, that, you know, not to do with the music, kind of physical directions. It's really interesting. Thank you. Um, first question. So dividing time between modern and Baroque playing, obviously you've come to Baroque slightly after you've already formed habits with your modern playing. Talk to us a little bit about that. Is there a different approach or how does that work? Um, yeah, they are quite different. I mean, there's some similarities, but um, I find that my relationship with practicing Baroque cello is really different because I began when I was uh, in my twenties, I suppose I was 20. Um, so I wasn't a six year old, I was 20. And therefore, and I already had all this knowledge about the cello and I was really interested in the cello. So I was coming at it with that, that mind. And then everything that even when you think of a beginner, I teach some really small kids. And the first thing they do is just they just want to like make a sound. They don't mind if it's not a very nice sound. But when you're 20 and you really care, then you, you're really trying to make it really good. And as you know, when you first start playing on gut strings, you know, they can sound a little bit, a little bit scratchy. And um, so, yeah, my experience was, was really different in that way. And, but I, it had a massively positive uh, influence on my modern cello playing. That's the bit I find really fascinating. Um, just the, the process and, and, and learning an instrument where of course the modern cello came from, from this. Um, and the people were still using gut strings I mean, my mom plays cello and she said it's got strings on her cello when she was a kid. So now I'm showing her age, but it really isn't that, it's not that long ago that people just had, had got strings on instruments. So they're not really that different. Mm. So my question for you next, actually, is there such a thing as too much practice? Can you overdo it? Yeah, absolutely. Yes, I think so. I think, um, I mean, I, I sometimes wonder if I was to be able, if I could quantify the amount of practice I've done in my life from when I was a child to now. I mean, it's hours of practice. Like practice has been such a big part of my life from playing out in the street as a kid and being called in, come on, you have to come in for your practice. Uh, you know, practice is just a thing. It's the same as, you know, having your three meals a day. It's just something that you do. Um, and for the most part, I'd say I've always liked that. I've actually kind of enjoyed, okay, like any child, you're like, I don't want to do it. But as soon as I'd start into it, I'd, I'd like enjoy it. Um, but when I think of all of those hours, I really wonder sometimes how much uh, time is really useful and how much of it is really not useful <laughs> at all. Yes. And we develop, develop some really, really bad habits. 
and then you go and do your degree and try and undo your bad habits. So it's a it's a it's a it's a circle, isn't it? Circle of learning. Yeah, what's that number they say? Number of hours to become an expert? Is it ten thousand hours that you need in anything to become an expert? But they don't say if it's mindful hours or not. That's yeah, that's the thing. I mean, it it is. It's interesting, and I would say like the quality of practice. Um, I remember when I was in in college, in music college, I'd come from Ireland where you know, I mean, I was at the academy in Dublin, and there were, we were a lot of us were really serious about our instruments. Um, but it wasn't like a specialized music school. So when I went to London, there were some kids who had been in music school and, you know, they were phenomenal. And they were just in this kind of routine of like practicing hours. So of course I went to the inn and I was like, first week, I'm gonna like do my six hours practice. And I, I didn't know, I just didn't know what to do. I was like, what do I do in this time? I have no idea how to practice for that long. So then you start getting really frustrated with yourself. And I think that's when all the kind of, the bad practice starts because you're kind of making yourself do something um and actually sometimes I think the best a lot of really good practice can happen away from an instrument somewhere yeah. else that's really interesting isn't it in the we're conditioned to think about practice in terms of quantity uh, rather than quality a lot of the time I remember in music college in London in my first year being given a little grid that was like this is the number of hours per day you should do in year one and this is the number in year two and looking at it and thinking oh <laughs> I'm not quite sure what I'm going to do because I wasn't taught to practice in the right way it's an interesting thing um, yeah good practice versus bad practice and we all have those days where you go to practice and it's not happening and like, firstly, why, why does that happen? What's the, what are the variables that make that happen? And then what do you so, do? You realize I think if, if, I, if I knew that answer, I'd be, uh, I'd have a career in, in that, wouldn't I? Um, I think it's just like anything. I mean, there's days we wake up and we feel, um, you know, it's a physical thing. You know, the way some days you just, you wake up and you feel great. It's like, you know what, I'm gonna go for a walk or a run or whatever. And you just feel like your body is on your side. Um, and other days, everything feels really kind of heavy or restricted or a bit achy. Or, you know, so this like, I feel like sometimes it's like a feeling of feeling buoyant as opposed to feeling like lead and feeling really heavy. Um, and they're really different feelings. So I, I find that the practice, um, some practice can be just really hard, but saying that, um, I not to sound like, oh, it's all about hard work, but actually you figure out some great things on the really hard practice days because you really have to kind of think, how can I make this work today? And then uh, that's the stuff that I think sometimes can stay, stay with you. But I, I would advise uh, from experience, I would kind of make, I'm, I'm a determined individual and I'm very impatient. Um, I can imagine my family watching that going, oh, she's, she's admitting it, she's just saying it there. But you know, um, I am really impatient. So I would have struggled with having the patience. Uh, now that I'm a bit older, I realize at times I'm like, look, Aoife, and I'll say it in, you know, to myself, say my name to myself and say, you've got to leave that, park that bit and, and just take a break and do something else. Because it will start to get worse if you keep prodding. And, uh, you know. Yes, I know that one. Yeah, okay. So there's another thing, just something that I noticed, and I wondered what your thoughts are on this, that in my other life teaching violin and viola, I noticed that sometimes in students, there was a tendency to over-focus and that students might get in the way of themselves. You know, there's a tricky passage and it's uh, everything's happening and they get out of sync or they just lose it. And, blah. and actually one of the ways I found to help them find their way through it was to ask them to stand on one leg. Completely bonkers, but once they're worried about falling off their leg, they're not over-focusing in the same way. Is there an equivalent strategy for the cello or are there things that you can do to think around an obstacle like that yeah I think it was something I was talking about a bit earlier which is I was I was practicing something and I'm moving around and thinking of this global because I would find that happens to me I, I would be like this is the bit this is the bit I'm worried about here it is here it is and you know and I kind of build up into this uh, you know rabbit in the headlights or whatever deer is it a deer or rabbit um and but yeah, I think that this, that's a really good one, one leg. I think for cellists, I often get my students to think of their two feet 
a lot and then or just think of their feet in general or like to think of a toe and like think of your little toe on that foot what's it doing can you feel like through your shoe you know just so it's a similar thing of just taking the mind away from what's happening with the hands and the arms you know and and, and trying to put focus somewhere else and then you, as you probably notice it's it's immediately solves the problem um but I, I had a similar thing i think when i was learning to drive over focusing on you know you're meant to be this far away from the side of the road and, and trying to line everything up and then your kind of instinctive sense of space is gone and everything starts to to go really badly yes it's that loss of panoramic vision isn't it where everything narrows and you just yeah but i think it's um that's that's fear as well though i mean that's what happens to us in uh in a fight or flight situation i mean that's like a proven um what's the word but that's just something that happens to us in animal or actually it happened to my dog the other day because it went it ran after a chicken never seen a chicken grabbed the chicken and pinned it down we had to try and separate the dog from the poor chicken and the dog was completely stiff you know picked him up and he was like you know staring one direction whole body had gone solid you know and it's just that kind of fight flight um so some of the best things to change that is just like you know standing on one leg because would you stand on one leg if there was a bear in front of you about to attack you you know but if you're like, i'm just going to stand on one leg it, and it brings us back into a yeah a more kind of global sense of where we are 360 version of ourselves rather than you know and it's it's interesting how just notes on a page you know sometimes you look at something just like that and think this can in, this can instill that kind of level of fear, you know, and it can't, can't it? Mm-hmm. It doesn't mean to, but it does sometimes. <laughs> I mean, yeah. Well, we've just got time for one more, I think, today, and that's um, if you could talk to yourself as a student now, with the benefit of your experience and thinking deeply about your practice, what advice would you share with students, Eva? Um. I would, I would really like to be able to meet student Aoife and tell student Aoife that, you know, you're good enough and stop being so hard on yourself. Um, because I was really, I mean, I, you know, you have to be hard on yourself to get better, but I was a bit too hard on myself, I think. Um, and also, I suppose, yeah, like I, I said earlier, like practicing slower and being more patient. Um, but there's also some things you just can't know or can't, uh, it's all about the experience. So there's times when you're a student where you think, oh, I, I should be able to do this, and why isn't this, and why isn't that working? And it's like, well, you, you have to experience it, as, you know, in real life, in a concert, or um, and especially with playing with other people. I mean, you can't experience being in a wonderful orchestra, a wonderful chamber group, um, unless you're doing it for a while. So that's what I'd like to say to myself, I think. It's just, just again, it's wait and let life happen and see what experiences come and then you you always find something out even from those moments where it didn't go as well as you wanted you'll definitely find something out that day which you won't find out in the practice room i like that music is life yeah this is music sure is fantastic Aoife thank you so much for joining us today it's been really super to have you and um, I'm sure that people who've watched this today have got plenty of ideas to take into their own practice so thank you it's been really inspiring just have a couple of little things to finish off with today firstly I want to say thank you to the Department of Culture and the IBO's principal funder Arts Council Ireland for supporting this series Um, thank you so much to everyone who's joined us for these talks we hope that you found it interesting and informative we're sorry that it's the last one but the good news is there is more coming up from the IBO over the next couple of weeks. On Friday we have our principal keyboardist Malcolm Proud presenting a masterclass at 2pm and next week on June the 10th we have IBO presenting Rejoice Music to Lift the Spirit with works by Bark and Handel and full information can be found on nch.ie so I hope you can join us for those. Thank you, bye.